I'm McKinney Smith. After going through a divorce, my sister passing away, experiencing narcissistic abuse, and some significant health scares, I realized through sharing my story that I wasn't alone in my suffering. Suffering, subjective distress generated by the experience of being out of balance. In a deep dive to holistically heal mind, body, and soul is where I discovered peace, clarity, and connection. It is impossible to be truly wise without some real-life hardship, and we cannot develop post-traumatic wisdom without making it through, and most importantly, through it together. Social connection builds resilience, and resilience helps create post-traumatic wisdom, and that wisdom leads to hope. Hope for you and others witnessing and participating in your healing, and hope for your community. A healthy community is a healing community, and a healing community is full of hope because it has seen its own people weather, survive, and thrive. Martinez is a licensed therapist and certified coach specializing in helping women understand their attachment styles. With more than 13 years of committed experience in empowering adults in a variety of settings, she's the founder of It's Already Yours, a virtual mental health practice that caters to clients throughout California. She also serves as a CEO and founder of the Martinez Method LLC where she has successfully assisted many women in changing their attachment styles. Utilizing her distinctive self-anchored method, she inspires them to attract and maintain the love they genuinely deserve, both from within and from those around them. Angie's personal journey, overcoming the challenges of being a teenage mother and healing from abandonment, abuse, and a series of traumatic relationships drives her passion for assisting other women in reclaiming their power, achieving deep healing, and living the fulfilling lives they are destined to lead. So please welcome to the show, Angie Martinez. (laughs) Hi, thank you so much for having me here. I'm super excited to share this space and time with you and your listeners. Thank you so much, Angie, for saying yes and agreeing to come on and share your stories and your expertise with us. As I was sharing with you before we started recording, this year I have had so many therapists and counselors and experts come on and share their expertise and their stories. And not only Mm -hmm. is it beyond helpful to me, but to the audience that is listening, to the people that don't have access to therapy, people that want an idea of, you know, the things that they've been working on in those things. So I truly appreciate you for co-creating this experience and helping the community at large to heal. So thank you. Yes, absolutely. It's definitely my pleasure. It's my purpose. It's what I do. I just want people, especially women, I mean, all people, <laughs> no, no men hating here, but you know, I just, that's my, my mission is like where I, I know that I'm here on this earth in this universe to complete a mission and that is to help as many women as possible heal. So yeah, I, again, it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I remember a few years ago having a conversation with someone and it was like, even though I felt like I was living in my purpose, I was like, I don't really know like exactly what God has called me here to do. Like I, I know what I'm doing is the right thing, but isn't my purpose. And one day I woke up and I was like, I'm called to be a healer. Like, yeah. and that could be in so many different capacities, but mm-hmm. so I totally resonate with what you just said. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I love too how you just said, you know, a healer could be in so many different capacities because as you were talking about therapy earlier, I, it's a reminder for, for me and for anyone who's listening. It's like therapy happens in so many different ways, right? It's not just a sitting and doing talk therapy or, you know, virtual or in a room or whatever it is. So healing therapy happens in, in so many ways. And that's something mm-hmm. I didn't understand until, I don't know, in the last seven or so years with my own life experiences. I'm like, wow, this is like, I'm, I know we'll probably get into it, but uh, (laughs) 
I'm a big proponent of like alternative modalities when it comes like alternative and holistic. And so, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's what the the show is about, like our holistic healing journey. Right. And I love that you spoke to the point where like, you know, healing isn't just about going through like talk therapy. And there's so many different forms of therapy. I did an episode on that, but like we've had experts that have come on and talk about healing through art, healing through dance, healing through, you know, there's so many different ways in which mm-hmm. we can heal. And it's, it's good to, you know, combine what works for us and what we connect with. So I think that's a great place for us to even start. Cause I was like, do I even want to start with my, you know, icebreaker question, but I think starting with the different ways, you know, that, that mm-hmm. we can heal. Cause I'm sure for yourself personally, you've had different things that have helped you heal. So I guess my first question to you would be, more in terms of what modalities and what ways have you utilized to help you through your healing journey that helped the most? Mm -hmm. That's such a great question. (laughs) So I'm like, in my head, I'm like, where do I start? But I think it's the most, like, I guess it's important for me to lead with my healing journey was very spiritual in nature. And I sort of liken that to relationships being spiritual in in nature. And for myself, part of my healing had to do with my pursuit and my education to be a licensed therapist. And I just kind of knew I wanted to help people. But if, and I'm sure you know this because you've interviewed many therapists, it's like, Anybody who's a therapist or a psychologist usually gets into the field because they've had their own experiences and they've overcome their own things and had their own healing. And so that was really the impetus that led me into this field before I even knew I was being led into this field. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But I would say some of the most important things on my healing journey started with my spiritual connection to something that was greater than myself, right? So just feeling spiritually connected helped me find or helped me understand that there was a purpose that I was missing and that I needed to go find it. Part of the way that like, I think the window for my spirituality was meditation and just really having a curious and open mindset of anything and everything that sort of was presented to me. I started following a lot of people. I had one person who was a great influence in my life at that time. And I just kind of was watching what she was doing as far as Reiki, meditation, breath work, crystals, learning about my chakra system. So all that stuff really opened a door for me to explore like this spiritual, I guess, component maybe that I was missing my whole life because I was raised as a Christian. And I say like Christian in air quotes because we didn't really practice anything. We went to church on Sundays and maybe holidays and but there wasn't really anything ever that I felt connected with. So I I missed that connection. And so part of my healing journey, a big part of my healing journey was to start with meditation. I started with guided meditations because I just, you know, obviously I couldn't do it on my own. I, (laughs) I didn't know how to meditate. So I always tell my clients, start with guided meditations to help just keep you recentered, And then, yeah, just really exploring Reiki. I mean, like I'm not a Reiki practitioner, but I've had it, you know, I've had Reiki sessions done. So a lot of energy healing. I'm really big on energetics of things. So manifestation, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that really, I think, opened the door to my healing and something, a connectedness that I knew that I was always missing in I don't know, since I can remember, and I am familiar with your icebreaker question. <laughs> so <laughs> I was kind of thinking about that. And I was like, you know, what were the common themes in my childhood, right? Or growing up and a common thing for me, a common theme was feeling this lack of belonging anywhere. 
you know, I came from my biological father who pretty much abandoned me. And then my mom remarried and there was a blended family. I did not really ever feel like I fit in. And then just through school and like my teenage years, just not really belonging, right? Not having a sense of identity, Mm -hmm. which really, um, I think, lent itself to me getting in these relationships where my anxious attachment was like on the, on, like had free reign. (laughs) So yeah, it was really that sense of belonging that I was missing my whole entire life that when I had started my journey, like my healing journey with intention, I was like, okay, I feel like I belong to something. I identify with something spiritually. So those are, you know, I, I kind of listed a few modalities, but those are a few non-traditional modalities that really helped me to catapult my healing journey. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. I, I feel like there's a couple things in there that I want to unpack. And I want to start with, so you spoke about starting, I guess, your spiritual journey. And then you said, quote unquote, Christian. And mm-hmm. I kind of smiled because I can totally relate where I strongly believe I have a strong relationship with God. But mm-hmm. I feel like when it comes to certain religions or titles, it can mm-hmm. divide us. And I'm all about connection and finding sometimes that maybe in different beliefs of religion, typically they're talking about the same thing with different words, different labels, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, Or lack of understanding. So Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, like, I know in the Christian community, there are a lot of things that once you talk about spirituality, or once you talk about, I don't know, crystals or anything that you you Mm -hmm. mentioned, there's stigmas attached to their beliefs on things. Mm -hmm. And doing my own research and understanding, especially because when I was certified as as a mindset coach, being certified through Bob Proctor, who talks about the law of attraction, all those things. So I got a lot of flack from people who didn't understand certain things. Mm -hmm. So having Mm -hmm. to explain like, you know, Bob Proctor has a strong relationship with God. He's just trying to use godly principles and get people to understand these things from, I guess, a layman's terms, people Mm -hmm. who are non-religious, things like that. Right. But understanding that we as people, even when we do, you know, health tests or whatever, it, we have minerals within our body, all these different things. So just curious for you, especially even in the industry that you're in, mm-hmm. as I guess, have you had any struggles with the Christian community mm-hmm. understanding whether when you say spiritual or even if you talk about crystals or any of those things, have you had any struggles or issues with that? You know, I haven't got any like flack about it. (laughs) Uh, I have not experienced that personally. I tend to, you know, when I do like talk about that or if I'm posting that on my socials or if I'm like promoting that in any way, I always do and if and if I am working with clients and I bring that into our work together, it's always with just being super cognizant of okay, where is this person at? Is this going to be in contrast with you know anything that they currently believe? And just kind of getting a sense and a feel of it, and of course asking permission. Mm-hmm. But I think I tend to kind of just stay away from religion and politics <laughs> in, <laughs> in my work and, you know, publicly just because, I mean, not for the sake of like, I'm trying to avoid that confrontation or conflict, but I think also because inherently to me, they're, I don't want to say they're not important, but I don't want to let them steal the spotlight, right? Like it's mm-hmm. it's about more... It's about so much more than that. I'm on a deeper level when it comes to our healing. So to answer your question, I haven't really had that come up. I myself personally, I do believe in God and I do like identify as, you know, when I talk about God universe, to me, it's sort of like the same thing, one and the same. Mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, when working with people, I just try to be as respectful and mindful of whatever path is going to help me help them Mm -hmm. the most, right? So, like, Mm -hmm. 
if they are hardcore Christian or hardcore whatever they are, right? It's really about sort of utilizing that as maybe a vessel to tap into spiritual, like how are you spiritually connected? Because I also feel like, you know, being religious and being spiritual are two different things. Yes. And so the spirituality is the thing that I'm, is their internal resource Mm -hmm. that they already have that I'm just trying to tap into to get the healing yeah. Done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so totally understand. Totally understand. And then the other thing I wanted to unpack is you spoke about your your father abandoning you and then your mom remarrying and you having a blended family. So I know so I read the book attached. So, you know, I know what my attachment style is and all that. And I know how our childhood environment affects mm-hmm. our adult attachment styles. Yeah. So with you already speaking about your, I guess, or not completely, but you sharing with us your relationship with your parents, how has that affected you as an adult and even in the work that you presently do? Mm -hmm. It's interesting because I've been a therapist for many years and coach for many years, but I really started focusing on attachment theory a couple of years ago, maybe, you know, five or seven years ago. And it wasn't, and this was like after already being a therapist. So it wasn't until that time that I was like, I started making the connections for myself, really looking at how like childhood events impacted the way that I'm, you know, having my relational experiences as an adult. I guess, let me just back up by saying like, first of all, so my background as a licensed clinical social worker was more, was less like psychology and more sociology, right? So it was more on systems and families and less on individual, right? So individual, you would probably know, okay, we're going to look at attachment theory early on. So for me, that didn't happen till later. But once it happened, I was like, it was like the light bulb of the aha. And Also, I realized that it wasn't just the lack or absence of my biological father in my life, but also the presence of having a mother who was, and by the way, I have a great relationship with my mom. I love my mom. She's, you know, she was a single mom. She did it all on her own. She did the best she could. But there are some things that I I know now. (laughs) <laughs> there are some things that I know now, like the way that um, she was very kind of like overbearing and very strict and very like I had no privacy. So there was no trust. And mm-hmm. so it was like the absence of one parent and then the presence of maybe a very overbearing parent that kind of created this perfect storm for the way that I saw relationships for the way that I understood relationships for myself and other people. Mm -hmm. Once I understood that, then it was like a no brainer for me. It was like a, my, like a duh, like (laughs) how as a therapist that I miss like this really important piece of, yes, it does impact and it does shape the way that we have relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, And one thing I like to like differentiate with anybody that I work with and because it was really a big aha moment for me was that first of all our attachment style is not our personalities right so our attachment style is not something that is fixed it is not who we inherently are our attachment style has to do with our attachment system which our attachment system the sole purpose of our attachment system is to help us connect with people, right? Because we're human beings and we're wired Mm -hmm. to connect with people. So our attachment system helps us do that. So when our attachment system is activated, these are some of the behaviors, whether you're anxiously attached or you're avoidant or you're XYZ attached style, it's all the same purpose, right? We're When our attachment system is activated, we're all just trying to have relational experiences with people. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for somebody who's anxiously attached, like, like I was, and like a lot of the women that I work with, when our attachment system is activated, 
the sole purpose is just for us to restore that connection, right? And to not be abandoned. So really just like to, I don't know, break it down for folks that I am working with to help them understand like your attachment system is just activated. It's trying to do the thing that it's naturally supposed to do, which is connect you with people. Mm -hmm. And there are just ways that it's sort of malfunctioning in order to get that job done. So Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I mean, that was probably a very long-winded answer. <laughs> no, that's, <laughs> <your question. laughs> that's how it helped me understand myself, you know, when I'm having relations as an adult. So that was really big for me. Like, this isn't inherently who I am. It's just my way that I've been coping right? You know, with things thus far. Yeah, absolutely. So now I have two, two, two questions to mm-hmm. unpack because <laughs> one I guess, okay, so let's start with, for the listeners, for, you know, people who don't know anything about attachment styles, who haven't mm-hmm. read the book Attached, if you could quickly just explain what the attachment styles are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, just to preface with, I focus, really focus on working with women with anxious attachment, but there are four styles, which is anxious, avoidant, disorganized. And of course there is secure. So somebody who is anxiously attached usually has a negative self view and then a positive view of others. So this would be someone who maybe idolizes their partner or literally says, thinks of their partner as their better half, someone who completes me. The core abandonment wound would be, or the core wound attachment wound would be abandonment or somebody who, you know, a caretaker who is inconsistent. Mm -hmm. What else? They, we usually have a high fear of abandonment. That's like the core, core wound is the fear of abandonment. When our attachment system is activated, we really, the goal, like I said, is to restore the connection. So we are going to want to talk about it right away. We are going to maybe, you know, if we don't get a text back from our partner, we're going to text 20 times and just try to restore that connection, right? So that's going to be the other person. We're going to look to the other person to remedy our anxiety about being abandoned as an anxiously attached person. Avoidant. So somebody who's avoidant attached would have a positive self view and usually a negative self view of other people. Their core attachment wound might be something like rejection. So they might have had a parent or a caretaker who just didn't respond to their needs at all. Right. A lot of the times we hear, you know, back in the day, it was like, no. When the baby cries, leave the baby in the crib, let them self-soothe, you know, no co-sleeping. So that this, somebody who is avoidant attached might have experienced that type of caretaking in their early years. And I want to like also just stop in and mention here, it's a good spot to mention that both avoidant or all of our attachment, all of these attachment styles, we all do want connection. Right. Mm-hmm. So somebody who's avoidant has an avoidant attachment style. They, it's not that they don't want the connection. It's that they're afraid they have a fear too of being rejected or their needs not being met. Right. So somebody who is, has this avoidant attachment style, they're very hyper independent. They value their independence and autonomy. They don't want anybody to infringe on that. They don't depend you know, on others to validate them and they don't like to be dependent on to validate their partner. Mm -hmm. So when their attachment system is activated, they are going to want to deactivate. Okay. So when anxious people are activated, we, we want to go toward and then the avoidant wants to withdraw and sort of deactivate and have their alone time. Mm -hmm. Someone who has a disorganized style of attachment would be sort of a combination of the two that I just described. So they want that intimacy and that closeness, but they have a fear of maybe trusting that they can trust. And then also, you know, obviously we have secure, which (laughs) I always like to, you know, I just like to make it a point that secure is not perfect. 
you know, somebody with a secure attachment doesn't mean that they're a perfect person, just means that they are internally resourced and they have great coping skills. They have a very direct, you know, open communication. They have tolerance. They can self-soothe and they have a very regulated nervous system. So when things come up, they're able to navigate that in the best way possible. Mm. Thank you for explaining all those. I I felt like for people who don't know anything about attachment styles, like prior to me reading the book Attached, I knew nothing about attachment styles. (laughs) And after I read it, I was like, oh, wow. Like, I think I read it about three years ago. So I think back then when I read it, I was secure anxious, but Mm. it allowed me to look at the relationships around me, family, friends, you name it, and actually be able to like see very easily Mm-hmm. other people's attachment style. So it was a very yeah. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of mind blowing when you know what you know, you can't unknow it. But I really like what you that you bring up the point of, you know, you were kind of little a flavor of two of them because also most people generally are mm-hmm. a combination of, you know, one or more different styles. So in fact, I would probably identify myself as anxious leaning sort of fearful avoidant. But so, yeah, I think that's an important point to bring up. Again, it's not our personalities. It's just how we've learned to navigate relationships based on past experiences that we've had. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I guess, what are some myths? Well, actually, you, you mentioned that some myths, I guess, people, some assumptions that people make around secure attachment styles. You know, you talked about it, you know, it's not that you're perfect. It's just, Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess, go ahead. I have a good, I have another, a good myth that I want to (laughs) bust. Okay. (laughs) That you're, now that you're asking. So, and I get the asked this question a lot of time and it's kind of like, it it could be debatable, but so I would say that it is a myth that you have to be first be securely attached or have a secure attachment in order to have a healthy, loving relationship. Mm -hmm. And this was my own personal experience in becoming what they call earned secure. So I do identify as like having a secure attachment now, but it was something that I had to work at. And a big part, and I can't believe I didn't mention this when you asked me about my healing journey (laughs) earlier. Sorry to my husband, but I'm going to mention now. (laughs) But a big part of helping me become secure in myself and in my relationship with other people was my relationship with my husband. So it is a myth, I think, that you have to be fully secure before you can have a loving, healthy relationship. On the contrary, I have personally experienced and had clients who experienced this as well, that a relationship can actually, a healthy relationship or being with someone who is secure in a healthy relationship can actually accelerate your journey to becoming secure. So mm. that is a myth I do want to bust. Mm-hmm. I I agree with, with that wholeheartedly because like I said, when I first read the book three years ago, I was definitely anxious, secure. And coming up, actually in like three weeks, will be three years with my partner now, but we've known each other since yeah. we were 15. And this is the healthiest relationship I've ever experienced in my life. And I feel like I am more secure because of my experiences in this relationship. Absolutely. And I love that you share that and bring that up because that's another thing that I, a topic that I like to teach on and, you know, speak on in my socials and whatnot. But is like the thing that nobody talks about is your first secure relationship after mm-hmm. <laughs> a slew of toxic, unhealthy relationships. Mm-hmm. It's like, especially if you are like somebody who's anxiously attached, you get into your first healthy relationship and that's the stuff nobody talks about. And there's so much, you know, for me, it was like, and bless my husband's heart, we we were together for a long time. We've only been married for a year. We've been together for like 13 years. And in the beginning, it was really, really rough. And he was like, we laugh about it now, but he was like, I, there were so many times where I just don't know if I could st- stick around because, you know, you were such a handful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and <I'm> like, <laughs> but, you know, we laugh about it. And I know my husband is 
he's a great man, but that is the kind of thing that you think about as someone who's coming into a healthy relationship. You're like, huh, am I actually, am I really able to heal? Like, is, is it, you know, there's so many bumps on the road when you're first entering a healthy relationship and you're like, wow, am I really inherently that broken that I'm still acting like this or these things are still coming up? You know, what is wrong with me? And mm-hmm. so I feel like nobody talk. I mean, we don't talk about that enough. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And normalize it. Enough. Absolutely. There is an episode I did, I believe it was earlier this year with Natasha Helwig, and we were both talking about we've had a history of unhealthy relationships and to now be in a healthy relationship, the challenges that come with that and the growth within us and being able to work through those things. So like you said, it's not talked about enough, but if anyone does want to listen to an episode on that, there is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's like, and, and I mean, especially because I'm assuming that you're talking about your partner as somebody who was secure. Mm-hmm. My partner was somebody who was secure and it was a lot of him reflecting back to me what he saw in me that I didn't mm-hmm. see in myself. And so there was a lot of mirroring that I did of, okay, this is how he handles conflict and him bringing things to my attention, like, okay, that's not healthy (laughs) and (laughs) it's hurting our relationship. And Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I do just want to like bust bust that myth. If you are not fully healed yet, you don't have to be, but it does help if you find somebody who is secure, who has a lot of patience and loves you. (laughs) Yeah. To pull you along on your journey. Like, I'm just going to pull you literally for the first couple of years or whatever. It is. <laughs> That's how it happened for me. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So, we were, so my partner and I, we were out with some friends maybe about a month or so ago. And we were around a bunch of couples that have been together for over 20 years. Mm-hmm. And I believe there was like maybe four or five other couples. And we were all talking about our communication with each other when we're not together. And everyone was sharing, you know, one couple was like, you know, my husband calls me every 30 minutes when he's out. The other one was like, yeah, like he doesn't even let me know when he's leaving the house. So, you know, everyone was talking about different stories. And my partner and I had shared that we don't like call or text each other Mm -hmm. while the other one is out with friends. We Mm -hmm. try to respect that space allow that person to feel comfortable and everyone looked at us like what (laughs) and I was thinking to myself (laughs) this is where I was actually really proud of my relationship and how secure we are with our trust with each other but also like we don't want either person to feel rushed or uncomfortable you know being out enjoying themselves with friends Mm -hmm. and feeling like you know I have to rush to get home or you know anything like that but it was just interesting to me how everyone else who had been together for over 20 years was so confused (laughs) by our behavior (laughs) by your method oh my god I love that you bring that up okay because same for my husband and I it's like we, you know, he is a golfer. And so it's like a thing, like if I'm on the golf course, like, and early on, like the first couple months of our relationship maybe is, was a learning curve for me on that. But now it's like, we both have that respect for each other of like, okay, when we're out, like we don't need to, unless it's something like an emergency, you know, pick, yeah, emergency, pick up whatever on the way home. We sort of respect each other's autonomy in that way. But I think it, I think it's, to double on that is like, it's not just the respect that we have for our own time, but also the trust and the security that we have Mm -hmm. in ourselves and in our relationship. Like it's like the unspoken trust of, no, I'm not worried about anything when, you know, he's out doing whatever. So therefore I'm not calling him. Right. In fact, I'm enjoying my damn me time. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Like (laughs) golfing takes a lot you know, usually it takes the whole day. So I'm like, oh, great. What am I going to do today and enjoy Mm -hmm. my alone time? So yeah, yeah, I think it's like twofold. It's like the respect plus the sense of like that subconscious security that you know you have of like, you're not worried Mm -hmm. about anything. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So what are some things that a woman can do to 
what's the word I'm looking for? Like if they want to be more secure in their relationship. Mm-hmm. I get asked this question a lot of times, <laughs> a lot, as you can imagine. And I often get it asked in like, how can I just hurry up and be secure? Mm-hmm. Right. And so I'd like to, I'd like to answer this question by first making it a point that being secure is not a destination and you're never going to be 100% secure. Like I still have my moments. Mm -hmm. So just knowing that being becoming secure is not a destination. It's a journey with a lot of lessons. There's a lot of learnings that need to happen and everyone's journey is very individual Mm -hmm. and I like to think it's very spiritual, right? So if, you know, what would I say to a woman to be more secure is having a sense of, I guess I can just start by saying like the journey to secure starts with yourself, Mm -hmm. right? It starts with knowing who you are as a person and being comfortable with who you are as a person. And I, I say this with, (laughs) with caution, like loving yourself as a person. Also for me, when I first started my healing journey, I was like, love yourself, love yourself. And I'm like, okay, but how? Because I don't even like myself. A lot mm. of a lot of parts of me I don't even like. So one way I work with women on developing that self-love is to practice self-respect mm-hmm. first, right? Practice self-respect on the daily. And you can do that by just making sure that your behaviors are in line with your values, right? A lot of times we as women, we don't even know what our values are. Like, what do I, what do I value? What are my most important values? Is, am I seeing congruency with my values in my 3D environment, like my, my reality, right? Mm -hmm. And so I would say part of being secure is developing that self-respect, right? Knowing, getting to know who you are, developing that self-respect, right? Strengthening that, which ultimately leads to self-worth and Mm self-love. And secure behaviors will follow. Like if you respect yourself, there's a lot of behaviors that you're not going to engage in. They're Mm -hmm. just going to kind of naturally just (laughs) fall off. (laughs) So, I mean, I guess that would be the most like general advice I can give on how to become more secure. So even as you answer that question, like every time you say something, I'm like, okay, I want to unpack this. So there's like two more questions I have. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So this is a two part question because, you know, you talked about what women can do to, to be more secure, but I guess what advice would you have for the women that are listening that are possibly sabotaging their relationship Mm -hmm. And then on the flip side, because you talked about what you will no longer accept. So Mm -hmm. what kind of woman is accepting the breadcrumbs? Mm. (laughs) Yes. Okay. So you saw, you talked about sabotaging behaviors and what kind of woman would accept breadcrumbs. Okay. So the first, I really like to highlight that our sabotaging behaviors, I like to look at them in a different regard, right? I come from a strength, I'm a social worker at heart. Like I come from a strength perspective. So I like to look at our sabotaging behaviors from, from, you know, how have they been helping us, right? How have they, it's the best way that we have been, we've known how to cope thus far. And it's, it's actually helped us to survive a lot of probably traumatic relationships that we've been in. So I like to look at our sabotaging behaviors as really our soul's way of shining a light on what our unmet needs are, right? So we usually look at our sabotaging behaviors and we're like, oh, I I hate when I do that. I want to stop. Like, I don't want to do that, right? And by doing that, we skip over the learning. We skip over the lesson. We skip over our soul communicating to us like, hey, there's this unmet need and that's why you're doing this behavior. So if we can identify what the unmet need is, then we can find a more adaptive and efficient way of getting that need met or AKA coping with whatever it is. Mm-hmm. So that's good. That's, 
That's the first part of sabotaging behaviors. Also triggers. I like to look at triggers in that way as well. And then to the second part of your question of, you know, what kind of woman accepts breadcrumbs? And that was a recent post of mine. I'm sure you saw it, but (laughs) I say, you know, I bring that up because I accepted breadcrumbs for so long as many of us women do. And it's because we just, we don't know our worth. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, we, once we know our worth, it's game over. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We are like, we're not, we know what we will accept and what we won't accept. Right. So breadcrumbing, you know, is like when men or people are just, you know, stringing us along, giving us bits and pieces, you know, hot and cold. And we're accepting that we're taking something because we think it's better than nothing. And the truth is that no, it's not. Right. Breadcrumbs are not better than nothing. Nothing is better than breadcrumbs because mm-hmm. you're exchanging those breadcrumbs for your self-worth. Right. So it's a matter of I don't even know if it's a matter of not knowing your self-worth. It's just about not having tapped into it. Mm-hmm. Like I one of my favorite sayings is like it's already yours. You just mm-hmm. have to look at it. Yeah. It's already an inherently within us from our ancestors, from, you know, I mean, I could go on a whole, <laughs> I could digress about that too. <laughs> like it's in our blood. Mm-hmm. We are, it's literally in our blood. We just have to find it and connect with it. And that is our worth that we are inherently worthy because we just are as women, as human beings. And once we realize that worth, then we're not going to accept anything less. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So the the reason I asked that, so like you said, I did see your Instagram post about breadcrumbs. And then there was another post that I saw online where it was like someone who accepts breadcrumbs won't understand someone who wants the whole cake. And so I ended up doing a TikTok version of that where I was talking about our, our perspective, our paradigm, our I guess our, what's the word I'm looking for? So if we haven't had certain experiences, if we've never experienced something, then we don't know what we're missing, right? So Mm -hmm. if this is our normal, if our normal is down here and we see someone whose normal is way up here, we can't resonate with that. We're not in in alignment with that. So we don't understand it. Our our mind is like, what? Like, Mm -hmm. I I don't get it. But when you have those experiences when you've experienced those that you know what you're missing you know like you know what I mean so I love (laughs) that you brought that up yes that is so (laughs) true it's like you don't have a frame of reference yeah you don't know what you're supposed to be treated like you don't know what it, it feels like right to be validated so yeah if you don't know you don't know but you know once you do know again it's like once you do know Then you're like, "Uh uh-uh, no way. I'm not accepting anything less because I know that I'm worth that. And I know that there's something better than this. Absolutely. Thank Thank you for bringing that up. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) So before we go to the final segment of the show, I would love if you could tell the listeners where they can stay connected with you, where they can learn more from you and about you. Yes, absolutely. So I, most of the time you're going to find me in my private women's only Facebook group. And it's all about women transforming their attachment style from anxious to secure. That is where I'm going to be giving away all my freebies, all my, I'm doing, I do a weekly live, which is live Q&A coaching. I do bring like guests on to do like breathwork workshops, just different things. So you can find me there, which is Secure, Healed, and Evolved, or She. And I do have a special offer for your listeners today. So anyone who joins my group and uses the code, the discount code or the code word, heal her, I will gift you a 30-minute intensive with me. And as a bonus, if you refer a friend, I will up that to a 45 minute intensive. And I will also gift your friend a 30 minute intensive. These intensives are where we can workshop anything that you're currently going through, get you an individualized plan of action. And this is a great value between anywhere between three and $550. So 
that's a steal for uh, special yeah, for your you. listeners. <laughs> you can also find, they can also find me on my own podcast, which is no surprise, secure, healed and evolved. She <laughs> available on Apple or Spotify. And then of course, Instagram at Angie underscore the Martinez method. And then you can email my team at hello at the Martinez method.com with any inquiries. Love it. Love it. Love it. I will definitely have all of the links in the detailed section so they can click and connect with you directly. They don't have to search too far. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. No problem. So for the final segment, it's like a rapid fire. You can answer one word or one sentence, but I don't like to put anyone into a box. So you are more than welcome to expand if you need to. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's start with what is one thing you wish you learned sooner on your journey? <laughs> I think we actually kind of talked about it before, but I'm going to say it here again because I think it's very important. I wish I would have learned, wish I would have focused on self-respect over self-love because that was just so much more tangible for me to enact my healing. Mm, thank you. Okay. Name a book that has changed or greatly impacted your life. Okay. Attached definitely has changed my life because it was a light bulb for me. But also I like Atomic Habits. Mm -hmm. That was a good one. Mm -hmm. And then, I don't know, probably Amanda Francis. It's uh, Rich AF. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. When you feel overwhelmed, unfocused, or uninspired, what do you do? Well, if you know anything about human design, <laughs> my I know I'm out of alignment when I'm frustrated. So I try to just take a step back and ground myself. I could do that by meditation. I like EFT tapping to get myself regulated. But normally, I just know I'm out of alignment if I'm frustrated or overwhelmed. So I just have to take a step back and mm. center. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Okay. What's one thing that people often get wrong about you? People often get wrong about me. Gosh, I don't know. I guess maybe, maybe I have heard, maybe sometimes people think I'm unapproachable, um, which is really weird because I'm a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I, I have got that a few times. Okay. Okay. When and where are you the happiest? Mm. I am the happiest. We love to go to the mountains. So specifically our favorite spot is Big Bear or Lake Arrowhead, but I'm a mountain girl over the beach any day. Okay. Okay. Fishing. Mountain <laughs> fishing. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And last but not least, what do you wish women would do more of? What do I wish women do? What do you, I wish women would practice or enact more self compassion? Mm. And I I can't remember where I heard this, but there are studies that the more that our self compassion goes up, the more that our anxiety goes down, um, especially in relationships. So I feel like I wish women would just be more compassionate ourselves. I feel like we're so, we have so much compassion for anyone else in our life, mm -hmm. right? We have so much grace and so much flexibility with anyone else in our, in our life. I wish we would just turn that inward more. I feel like shame is probably the biggest barrier in healing. Mm -hmm. And so if we could just have more self-compassion, I think that would also decrease a lot of that shame and accelerate our healing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Angie. I loved our conversation. Thank you so much for sharing space with me today, for co-creating this experience with listeners, for sharing your wisdom and your journey. I truly, truly appreciate you. And I do not take this time lightly. So thank you yeah. so much. <laughs> Absolutely. McKinney, oh my God, it was such a, this was an experience. And for the listeners in the beginning, before she pushed Ricard, I was like, I'm a little nervous because I've never <laughs> actually been a guest. I always have guests. And you are just so like, you have this presence about you. It comes through in, in the work that you're doing. I listened to your episodes. I felt it here today. 
Malika wasn't wrong. <laughs> you are a great, you're just an amazing soul. And I thank you for the work that you are doing. I think it's amazing. And it was such a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you so, so, so much. Yeah. And to all of the listeners out there, if you are not already subscribed, make sure you go and hit that subscribe button. We would love to hear what aha moments you had to take away from what Angie had to share. If you want to share that in your review, if you want to tag us on Instagram, you can tag Angie at Angie underscore the Martinez method. You can tag myself at the real McKinney Smith. A healthy community is a healing community and a healing community is full of hope because it has seen its own people weather, survive, and thrive. So let's continue to heal her.